So hello everyone and a very good afternoon. My name is Annie and I'll be your host for this webinar today. Thank you very much for coming along to this webinar to discuss institutional responses to sexual violence and epigeums responding to disclosures of sexual violence, guidance for staff, collaboration. We should be taking about 45 minutes of your time today, including an opportunity for a designated questions and answer session at the end. So firstly, just a couple of introductions. We're joined today by a panel of experts for our collaboration, including our lead advisor, Professor Nicole Westmarland, our Australian advisors, Professor Andrew McCauley and Dr. Corinne Manning, and Epigeum Associate Commissioning Editor, Tessa Dagley. And I'll let them all introduce themselves now, um, starting with Nicole on the left. Hi, uh, I'm Nicole Smarland. I'm a professor of criminology at Durham University um, in the northeast of England, uh, where I'm director of the Research Centre into Violence and Abuse. Hi, I'm Professor Andrew McCauley from Southern Cross University. I'm one of the deputy vice chancellors there, uh, with responsibility for a, a wide range of portfolio, but it does include student associations and general student matters. Hi, I'm Corinne Manning. I'm the Deputy Director of Diversity and Inclusion at La Trobe University, which is in the state of Victoria. Hi, I'm Tessa Dagley, an Associate Commissioning Editor at Epigeum. My role is to work with all involved in this project, including the advisors, reviewers, development group members and in-house team. Okay, thanks everyone. So just a quick look at the agenda before we get started. First, we'll look at Epigeum itself. We're the organisation that put together online courses through a unique collaborative model. Then we'll move on to Nicole's presentation, who will tell us more about learning from research policy and practice. Following this, Andrew will give an overview of whole community responses at universities. Corinne will then discuss creating a safe and positive university environment. And finally, Tessa will talk in more detail about Epigeum's online approach. And we'll wrap up with a Q&A session at the end. So just a quick overview of Epigeum. We were founded in 2005 as a spin-out originally from Imperial College London. Our two founders created the company in response to what they felt was a lack of timely support for researchers. And they saw this as an opportunity to work with universities to create accessible and interactive supportive materials for researchers. Over the years, we've expanded to studying programs, courses for students, and teaching and leadership programs, programs for staff. We were acquired by Oxford University Press in May of last year. Oxford University Press are actually a division of Oxford University and so are a non-for-profit organisation in a higher education context. We've created over 92 online courses across 23 different programmes and we currently have four in development. So we're an increasingly globally focused organisation and have worked with over 260s across 30 countries worldwide. We've worked with many in Australasia as well and this is a map to show you what countries have been involved in the development of our courses. And I'd just like to show you a short video which will explain our development process to you. The story of an Epigeum course. We come up with an idea and we consult widely to develop and fine tune it. We commission a team of expert authors to write it and a team of expert reviewers to help them. We commission a lead advisor who gives strategic vision and leadership. And we bring together a team of universities who form a development group to give feedback on our plans and prototypes and to make sure the product meets their needs. The collaborations we build are drawn from across the world and often involve input from over 50 academics as well as our team of in-house specialists. Because we believe that collaboration and iteration are the key to producing truly innovative and effective products. So we bring everyone together for a launch workshop at the start of each project. It's a great mixing pot where the creative juices can flow and expertise can be shared. We provide a week-long training course for our writing team to make sure they're able to get the best out of the online medium. And we provide plenty of opportunities for sampling and feedback along the way through a detailed peer review process. In fact, a typical product goes through at least five iterations before it's ready to be built by our in-house developers. Together, we're more than the sum of our parts, and our unique and rigorous product development process gives all collaborators access to groundbreaking courses that couldn't... Okay, um, to summarise the content of the video you've just seen, here are a couple of bullet points. The development group of universities come together and share their experience at a workshop to help us create a really great online course. 
We recruit authors, all under the guidance of a lead advisor, and the advisory team we put in place shape and lead the vision for the programme alongside our team. We have a meticulous review process which allows the development group to look at the content of the courses, check that it matches their expectations and comment on it as well. The development group of universities are the early adopters who get to use the programme and implement them at their universities and then we make it available to other universities on a licence basis. And I'll briefly touch on implementation here which is how the course can be used at your institution and this is in a number of different ways. Firstly, it can be used as a standalone academic course. You can supply the participants with an online multimedia rich course immediately at the time and place they need it. And so this would be a self-study mode. Secondly, we have the option for tutor supported online courses. And finally, it can be used as part of a blended learning program. And typically how this works is that participants are given access to the online course ahead of a workshop. And then the workshop would really focus on consolidation and application of the material. And you can also do it in all three ways at once. So hopefully that's given you a bit of background to Epigeum and how we put the programmes together. I'd be happy to take any questions on that process, but for now I'll hand over to Nicole. So I'm going to be talking um, about some lessons from research policy and practice um, in responding to sexual violence on campus from um, a piece of work which we did for our sexual violence task force uh, with uh, two of my postgrad students, uh, Hannah Boz and Stephen Burrell. Um, so why now and why should we be doing this? Um, so obviously there's been an increasing awareness generally about the scale of sexual violence um, in society. In the UK we've had some really high profile cases involving celebrities and things, um, which has made more people start speaking out about it. And of course students are part of the, the general population um, and they've been starting to be much more vocal um, about speaking out about sexual violence and, and starting campaigns and things. And this in turn has, has helped um, get, get it onto the agenda of universities. Um, the Hunting Ground, the American uh, documentary, has also been very influential here in the UK um, in pointing out um, some of the inequalities which underlie uh, the high rates of, of sexual violence. We've had more high profile legal cases uh, over here in the UK as well, which obviously universities uh, want to avoid. Um, and all of this has added up to much more awareness about sexual violence being an issue. We see student level feminist activism in particular on a really big increase um, generally. When I first started at, at Durham University 10 years ago, there was no student societies at all. And now we have a university-wide student society and at least one student society in each of our 16 colleges. Uh, so we have many, many uh, student feminist societies now within the university from, from zero or ten years ago. Uh, and obviously one of the key issues which they're starting to campaign on and one of the key issues which is affecting them is sexual violence. We also see increased parental involvement at universities these days in terms of our open days, in terms of parents asking questions, in terms of parents wanting to ensure that their students will be safe if they come to our university. So sexual violence now I think represents a key reputational risk um, and potential impact on student satisfaction surveys. And it's just not an issue that's going to be dropped anytime soon. So it should be something which we are responding to sooner rather than later. This is some of the excerpts from a newspaper report, an online newspaper report, which were quoted when uh, another university in the UK, um, University of York, published uh, a press release to say that they were going to be starting consent classes in their university. Um, and like other universities which have done something similar, they immediately got so much backlash over the idea that they want to be trying to keep uh, students safe. So I'm not going to read them all out, but you know, it, they said, people said it was patronizing, it was anti-male, it probably wouldn't prevent a single rape. Um, the bottom right comment, there is no correct way to negotiate getting somebody into bed with you, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, just by saying, you know, the idea that you are negotiating people into bed in itself uh, is, is an example of how the backlash against these, and when you read the backlash against it, it really does emphasize the need for the programs uh, in the first place. 
Um, so in terms of the UK and the current policy situation, I know others are going to be um, talking about the um, Australian context after May. In the UK, we've tended not yet to have specific sexual violence policies or even broad violence against women policies. Our national level government policies until until now haven't talked about tackling violence against women and girls in terms of universities. So we have hefty violence against women documents, strategies, multi-agency groups, which haven't really touched on universities until now. But it has been argued, and I, I would agree with them, that UK universities may already be legally obliged to ensure that women at university are able to enjoy their university free from abuse um, under our equalities legislation. Sorry, this site's a little bit out of date. It says that the ongoing review is due to report soon. It has just reported. So we do now have our first kind of legal guidance in, uh, in 20 years in terms of what we should be doing in terms of responses. So what do lessons from research tell us? Well, uh, from this um, rapid evidence assessment that we did uh, with um, Bose and Burrell, we found that there was strong evidence across a range of studies that show that the, that short-term outcomes can have positive effects in terms of bystander intervention style programs. They tend to have relatively similar content and outcomes, but the one which we looked at which had the strongest evidence was an American program called the Green Dot Program. And that's not necessarily to say that it's um, it's got a better program than UK programs that are starting or indeed other ones around the world. It's just to say that this is the one which we found which was the best researched. Um, it has longitudinal evaluation data, um, so it's useful in, in building a case. We tend to, in the UK, be having mixed gender groups. Some US evidence suggests that single groups, single sex groups might be more appropriate. Um, and early evaluations of our um, our NUS iHearts consent campaign shows certainly increased short-term understanding and feeling positive about the program. But it's again, it's too early in terms of the UK initiatives to be able to say anything that long-term. But the short-term uh, looks positive. Um, in our rapid evidence assessment, we did find that some US universities had developed risk assessment, sorry, risk reduction programs for female students. Um, which tried to kind of um, put in place initiatives that taught women, you know, what, what not to do, what to do if they felt unsafe, etc. But there's no um, evidence that victimization reduces from this, uh, especially for women who are already survivors. It can quite easily look and be criticized as, as being a victim blaming approach to dealing with sexual violence. So it's not one that I would be uh, recommending. There's no UK university at the moment that I know of that outlines the penalties that a student offender may be subjected to outside of the criminal justice system. Uh, the consequences tend to be con constrained within general disciplinary procedures, but some universities uh, in the US have developed specific penalties that, that cover a broad range of options. Um, from things like writing an essay uh, or doing a project about um, the impact of sexual violence on society right through to expulsion from the university. Um, Harvard does have a, spe a specific Office of Sexual uh, Assault Prevention and Response. Uh, at Dome University, I think we're the first university in the UK that has a specific post um, to deal with issues, and I predict that these type of positions uh, are going to be uh, increasing within universities generally, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, in our review, we found very little information about the effectiveness of specific support for universities, but uh, certainly working closely with the local rep crisis centre as we do in Durham is a model that's likely to increase in the future. Uh, and this model is also within a, a new NUS project called Stand By Me as well. Uh, we found in our review that changes appeared both stronger and longer lasting when the multi uh, when there was a multi-dimensional aspect intervention. So it wasn't just kind of a one-off thing that was done when students entered the university. It was backed up at different uh, points within their studies in different um, multimedia approaches. And leadership at the most senior level is, is really important. As I've already said, uh, the UK-based programs have not yet been evaluated 
for long enough to know about the long-term outcomes. Um, and at the moment, no UK university that I know of is auditing their sexual assault rates. So it's going to be difficult at the moment to be able to say whether um, the introduction of things like training, campaigns, interventions um, have had a, an impact on sexual assault rates. And few universities in the UK are training staff in how to respond to disclosures of sexual violence, although I'm aware that this is something which more and more universities obviously are considering at the moment. So I end really with some footsteps to say that, you know, we, we definitely haven't got this sorted yet. We haven't got this sussed. We're right at the beginning of what is likely to be a, a long journey in terms of understanding how to respond to disclosures of sexual violence. Um, and really I see this online training not as something which a, a university puts in place and says, oh great, we've, we've got that sorted now, we can tick that box, but rather to say that, that this is the first step um, in a process of responding to sexual violence. I think it's an important step because it's something that we can roll out pretty quickly. Uh, it can be a, uh, applied to new staff coming in. Uh, we can make sure that we do the best for our students and we can also do the best for our staff to make sure that they know and they feel confident in knowing what they should be doing in this situation. They don't feel kind of left with this as, a, as an issue um, either. Uh, so thank you very much for listening uh, to my presentation. Thanks very much Nicole. So now I'll pass over to Andrew. Thank you. So within the context in Australia, you would have to have been living probably under a rock not to have noticed the impact of the hunting grind over the last year or so. And when the hunting grind project sort of came into Australia about September last year, um, it really created the energy for the Australian university sector to, to begin to create a collaborative and, and a comprehensive approach to the incidents and the responses to sexual violence across our campuses. And, and while it, it, it was challenging at the time, and still is, um, and because it was bounded in a cultural context that was different to Australia, <clears throat> there was all sorts of pros and cons uh, around that. But setting those aside, in my experience, it still gave a very useful vehicle for a discussion around the issue of sexual violence. And I think that, to my mind, was its key contribution to me as a senior executive within a university. And obviously, those of you that are familiar with the hunting ground, the, the key issue that it really drew attention to was the failure of some of the American universities to effectively respond and also to respond appropriately. And that really is a challenge for any senior member of a university these days. The part of the impact of the hunting ground coming to Australia was that they, to some extent the sector um, was a little bit on the back foot. Um, but Universities Australia moved quite quickly to develop its own campaign around respect now always, which again has had quite a, a wide exposure across the sector. And again, the positioning of that particular campaign was that sexual assault and harassment are unacceptable and that we have to seek to empower those who have experienced sexual assault or harassment so that they can seek help and support if they, they need it. And the campaign is, is, is really being quite effective with posters and other support material that universities are using uh, to help to raise awareness and to support our students and also to raise the issues around the whole role of bystanders and also to give them the confidence and the encouragement in a sense to speak up should they find themselves in a situation where they're observing um, or a sexual assault or sexual harassment taking place. The third element that really sort of formed part of the broad background within Australia, I think, also was work that the National Union of Students Women's Department had done. And they, in a sense, not surprisingly, had been um, aware of this issue for, for some time. They did a previous survey called Talk About It uh, back in 2010. And in 2015, they re-ran that survey, which covered a whole range of student life issues. Uh, not just around sexual assault, but included accommodation, work experiences, campus life, and, and so on. But clearly, the, the, the focus that linked into the discussion that we've had in this last year in Australia was around sexual assault, harassment, and some of the, the broader difficulties that that gives rise to. And in a sense, while no individual survey can give a total picture of what is actually going on, 
in, a, in their survey of just over a thousand respondents that answered a particular question, 27% of them were reporting some sort of experience of sexual assault, which could range from relatively minor right up to 7.3% uh, or 78 of those respondents uh, reporting that they had experienced rape. And that is one of the challenges, I guess, for the sector in Australia is that there is no comprehensive data available on uh, the incidence or the prevalence of, of sexual assault in its broadest sense. And that, in a sense, has been part of the process of what's also been gone, going on in the last um, few months, since July or so. And that has been the creation of the independent survey, which the uh, Universities of Australia have been working with, the Australian Human Rights Commission, and also with the Human Rights Centre at the University of New South Wales. And through that work, a survey has gone into the field to try to understand the prevalence and the reporting experiences and the responses to sexual assault and sexual harassment in, in our universities. And that survey is still in field at the moment, and I think most universities will complete that process uh, in the next few weeks and certainly by the early part of December um, this year. Now, the survey has been a challenge, and we can maybe take any further comments on that. It's not an easy thing for people necessarily to respond to. Um, the methodology has been quite complex, um, but in the lack of any other data, as I said, apart from some of the insights that the NUS survey has given us, this will be our first sector-wide tool, if you like, in the water to see what sort of information we get. And from my point of view, it may not be perfect, but it's better than absolutely having no data whatsoever. And it is part of the, what will be the ongoing process of learning about how we can improve that kind of reporting for the future. So I was asked to give some thought to the, sort of the senior management perspective, being a, a deputy vice chancellor within one of the universities here in Australia. And I guess reflecting on my experience um, over the last year and so, and so on, working with Universities Australia, working with the Hunting Ground, and working with my colleagues within the sector, as well as those locally at Southern Cross. And what I find is that, not surprisingly, I mean, a lot of senior managers um, really have no direct experience of, of managing sexual assault or harassment, which is good in some ways, but on the other hand, when you do get it, coming across your desk as an issue, then having some background would probably be helpful. The senior management role uh, also, I think, is not just to be isolated in this, in this way. I think there's a, there's a gap of knowledge, I would say, across many levels of, of management within university, apart from the, the obvious areas that specialize in counseling and so on, where they would have much more direct experience. But the general uh, rank and file, if you like, of directors and heads of schools and, and senior management. I think there's there's still a lot of work to be done there in terms of understanding what, what some of the appropriate responses would be. From a senior management point of view, it is clearly crucial to set the tone and the approach for the institution. That is, you know, we're going to take, take a position of zero tolerance. Uh, that is a, a categorical position. And um, therefore, that is a very important statement, I think, that the senior management can put out to the wider community. Um, it's also important to make strong links to the internal players that can influence and provide guidance and support to our students, as well as the external support agencies. Um, and that was very important within the Hunting Ground um, project, where we had panels to do Q&As and so on after the screening of the event. And I'll say something more about that in a minute. Um, clearly, senior managers have to be visible at events. They have to endorse those events. And they, I, in, in my view, it's very simply we have to be seen to be leading, to be collabor uh, sorry, collaborating, and also participating meaningfully in, in these events. And ensure also that our institutions have policies and procedures that are, are up to date and are you know, fit for purpose in terms of managing the, the complaints that they students may bring to us in relation to sexual assault, sexual harassment. And that, I think, is an important aspect of it because certainly in some of, even of our own policies, you could see that the balance of, you know, uh, sanctions on the student was probably about two or three times longer for plagiarism than it was for other incidences of, of misbehavior. And I think that's something we're in the process, certainly, of rectifying with my own 
within my own institution. And clearly, as a senior manager, we have the responsibility to create a safe and secure environment within which our students can live and, and safely go about their, their studies and, and their other parts of their lives that they, they conduct while they're with us as, as students. So the positioning for me that I adopted within the, uh, the hunting ground and, and, and so on was it was really crucial, I think, as a senior manager, not just to see it as a campus problem. Our campuses vary um, in terms of their makeup. Some have much more on-site accommodation, uh, some don't. And therefore, for example, we probably only have about 400 uh, bed spaces actually on our campuses, but other universities would be very different with many times that of students actually staying on campus. But even in our context, where we have only those, say, 400 bed spaces, the campus boundary is incredibly porous. And some of the issues that we experience are not just solely to do with the students that are part of our community, but they're also from people who come in from the town or the, or the, the neighborhoods outside the, the borders. And that's an important aspect of some of the issues that, that we then experience. And clearly, it's not just a campus problem, because Unfortunately, we know that um, domestic violence in the broader sense is an issue in Australia, as it is, in fact, globally in many, many countries in, in, in many different ways. And therefore, I think we, when shaping our responses, um, it's important to have a whole of community kind of response, and not just certainly to be seen as, it's, you know, Andrew as a Deputy Vice Chancellor taking a top-down approach to this. That would probably never really fully work. Um, it, to my mind, it was by working with internal agencies, by working with external agencies, and absolutely crucially by working with our student bodies that we got the response and the, and the discussion around the hunting ground and the wider context of respect now always. Uh, and I think that it's, it's obvious, but it, it is crucial, I think, uh, in terms to the whole success of what we've done and working with the key groups of the student executives uh, across all of our campuses. We have three main campuses, and therefore we have to work with three different groups in that sense. But it's absolutely vital to, to the success. And leveraging those resources, as I said a few slides ago, was, was crucial in terms of the hunting ground screenings because we, after each screening, we had a panel of members for Q&As. And on that panel, all those panels, we had student association reps, we had people from rape and sexual assault centers, we had police, we had university counseling and pastoral care staff, as well as executives like, like myself. And all of those panels really went very well in terms of the, the discussion and the frankness and the openness that the students in the audience adopted when they were asking questions and even starting to have debates between themselves. And I don't think across all of our showings, I think I had to pretty much bring everything to a a close because we were already about easily 20 minutes over our time because of the engagement through the Q's, Q and A's. And it was a really quite heartening in terms of the, the openness to the students to discuss some of the issues around consent, around all sorts of aspects of behavior, around sexual assault. And they, what struck me one thing in particular was that they, the rape and sexual assault center people uh, quite often commented that these kinds of discussions, they never seen them or heard them taking place before, would not have envisaged them actually taking place five years ago. So again, I think that's really quite refreshing. And, and while it's a difficult subject, um, I think it is one that when, when students are given the opportunity to address it, they certainly embraced it, uh, as did the staff in terms of, of that dialogue. And, and that was a very much a positive outcome from my point of view. So really, just to, to draw to a conclusion, my contribution in a sense of giving you some insights to the senior management approach, if you like. I mean, the broad strategy essentially has been zero tolerance of sexual assault and harassment. Uh, the strategy has been to build a coalition of those that, that can influence that position. And internally, that's all the, the obvious kind of work units that many of you would have, student services, equity and diversity people, campus accommodation providers, the counseling and the student advocacy service. And obviously working with the students more generally as well is, has been part of that, that success. Um, we are 
still in the process, I would say, of raising awareness and looking at creating and providing resources uh, and offering support to those that need it. And, and this kind of the whole initiative here from EPGM, I think, is, is, is a contribution to those resources um, that we can draw on. And uh, there's no, not necessarily, to my, to my point of view, sort of any one resource that, that will do everything, but with a range of resources, we have the opportunities within our universities to maintain the discussion, maintain the momentum that has been created this year within Australia in terms of the hunting ground and respect now always. And I think we can then hopefully drive further change in behaviour as we go forward. And I think the crucial thing just for me in terms of the policy side of things is really to ensure that our policies are incredibly, if you like, simple to digest and that the students have a very clear way of reporting what has happened, uh, particularly in that sort of first responder type environment where there may have been an incident. You know, what do they do? Who should they go to? How do we escalate that reporting through the university executive? so that we get to know quickly and effectively uh, can then respond to what has happened. And then there's a kind of a phase, it's probably maybe 24, maybe 48 hours afterwards, uh, where the student also has to have a very clear understanding of what the policy is and how they can go about reporting formally through the complaints process and so on. So all of those things have to be put right and, and again from my point of view, having had exposure this year to the hunting ground and so on, uh, we're able to look at our policies and, and, and make those changes. Um, universities are great at policies and often they're pretty, you know, uh, misunderstood. It's very difficult to, sometimes very difficult to make your way through them as it were. Uh, and in this case in particular, we've got to make sure people know what to do if they've been affected by an incident of sexual assault or sexual harassment. So for me, it's been an interesting process. It's been an important piece of work. And the work that's been done this year, um, I think, will now integrate into an ongoing and sustainable project as we go forward uh, to maintain the momentum that we've created and to improve the, the safety um, of all of our students on, on campus. So it's really been very, very insightful for me. So I look forward to learning from colleagues through this process. And thank you for, for listening to me. So thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'll now hand over to Corinne. Uh, thank you very much. And I think, you know, my presentation actually dovetails very well with what Andrew was just talking about in terms of the policies and the procedures and the translation of those into what is a positive and uh, a safe community for people within universities. So um, in the context, I guess, of responding to disclosure, you know, safety really is the key to building positive university environments. And today I'd really like to discuss the critical issues of emergency response and also the provision of services and support to students in creating that positive uh, university culture. I think what is really essential is actually having a holistic approach to safety and by that I mean that physical safety is imperative but so too is psychological and emotional safety. So students really need to feel supported not only to reach out in those times of immediate danger or crisis, you know, such as calling security to respond to an incident, but they also really need to be aware of uh, other support services such as equity, diversity and counselling that can assist them. And uh, I think another factor which is often neglected by many people in terms of the provision of service is ensuring that when people do contact these areas that they're confident that those who are responsible for uh, providing that support will genuinely listen to them and believe what they're saying and be capable of providing immediate support or referral. And that's certainly a message that's coming out through our experiences of being involved with the Hunting Ground and Respect Now Always campaign uh, is that students and staff really feel it's important that when they do reach out for assistance that the people that are providing that assistance are credentialed not only in terms of perhaps their professional degrees or expertise they have but more importantly their, their professional experience. They want to feel that they're in a trusted environment. I think really what seems to be a trend in discussions certainly from my perspective around responding to violence in many Australian universities 
is really a focus on the emergency response. And while I acknowledge that this is critical, you know, just as essential as providing a trusted accessible service for people who wish to disclose after an incident has occurred or when that emergency response just isn't appropriate. So, you know, what does a positive university culture actually look like? And I think going back to what Andrew was talking about in terms of policies and procedures, we often have a lot of governance around what is unacceptable behaviour. But I think it's really critical too that people come to understand what positive behaviour looks like. And certainly in a student environment, we're more likely to get traction in terms of that type of language that we use rather than talking about what you, can, you can't do opposed to what you can't do. And I think that um, certainly using these key mechanisms through policies and procedures is great in terms of governance, but one of the really key drivers for communicating is through effective measures for our students, such as social media. So getting them involved in the messaging about what positive behaviours look like and getting them generating the, um, the discussion and the support even for around disclosure and getting them not to be those who are responsible for solving a problem or dealing with an issue, but referring on to appropriate services as possible. So we too have been working with many of the student bodies and organisations so that the students are actually a vehicle for the communications around what positive behaviours look like. They're actually generating a lot of the key messaging and also acting as a vehicle for referring on to services within the university. And I think that leadership and role modelling, Andrew was talking about it from the perspective of the senior leadership within universities, but we also have such an important leadership cohort amongst our students that leadership in general and role modelling in general amongst the key leaders throughout an organisation is actually really critical. And it's one thing to have communications and to have the policies and procedures, but if people aren't actually role modelling those behaviours, then they just seem to be marketing and spin. So it's really critical that people are walking the talk. Another key area, I think, in terms of positive university culture is providing a trauma-informed support. And that is that it's victim-centred, um, that the approach really emphasises the physical, psychological and emotional safety for both support providers and victim survivors. And another area which I think people often um, neglect is looking at the idea of intersectionality. So when an incident actually occurs, are there other factors that people need to consider that may be compounding a certain incident or situation, such as um, the background of the, the victim survivor? Is it uh, an incident involving somebody from the LGBTI community or a refugee community? And if so, in terms of our response and our support to the victim survivor, do we therefore need to reach out to other areas of the university that have expertise in this space so that the support we provide is uh, fit for purpose and relevant and effective and as supportive as possible for people within those communities? Now, I talked before about the fact that a lot of focus seems to be around emergency incidences and response within Australian universities. And I think that one of the key things is the issue around security versus safety. So many universities, well, most universities have a security area. Some have rebranded it as safety. And in some ways, this is causing a bit of confusion, I think, within the university cohort about what constitutes uh, uh, security coming to an incident and what is actually a safe environment for people to uh, disclose. So I think it's really important in terms of areas for reporting and options for reporting that there's a consistent language even amongst those areas so that people understand that when they do choose to disclose, whether it's to security or whether it's to equity and diversity or counselling, that there's a consistency of approach in terms of uh, the support they'll get in emergency incidents. Also that we need to have really professional security staff. And certainly one of the trends is here has certainly been to, um, to outsource security services within universities. And that's creating some issues around credentialing and quality of security staff who are working within our university environment. So measures such as ensuring that within the contracts we actually have mandatory training required that goes beyond 
first aid that goes beyond some of the basics into areas such as responding to disclosure or looking at trauma-informed approaches to uh, providing care and support for people in university. And also that security staff are aware that they can also get support from other areas of the university if they are dealing with an incident. So if, as previously stated, I was talking about intersectionality. So if, if it is a victim who has come from a community such as the LGBTI community, that they can then reach out to get the appropriate support and assistance from the area of the university for which there's expertise. So it's about ensuring that when we do have an emergency incident that the staff that are the first responders are confident and capable of actually managing that situation. Next slide, please. So responding to disclosure in terms of, of the student perspective, I want to talk about this um, separate. So I want to talk about responding to disclosure in terms of students and then talk about the staff perspective. And what we're actually seeing is that most disclosures, certainly within La Trobe University, are not in response to emergency incidents. That um, people are actually coming up to us is sometimes days, months, even years after events taking place, but it is the first time that they've actually disclosed. And they're not necessarily disclosing to um, even key support areas, they're disclosing to academic staff or professional staff that they've gotten to know and trust. So our prevalence, certainly within La Trobe University, is that most students are not uh, disclosing in response to emergency incidents, that it is post that. And that's why we really need multiple options for reporting. And within the university context, most areas have, you know, a security area, safe community unit, counselling, equity, diversity, these sorts of things. So we need to ensure that we have a first response set of guidelines so that when somebody does actually choose to disclose to a particular area in the university that there is that consistency and set of guidelines that actually manages the pathway for disclosure so that the experience of somebody is um, equal and consistent regardless of where they choose to disclose. The other thing that we've certainly found is that some victim survivors are being pinballed from area to area within the university. So it's really crucial that we actually have a central triage process so that if somebody does disclose to a particular area and yet they are not the most appropriate area in terms of case management, that they refer on to a case manager who is able to then get the multidisciplinary people within the team to appropriately support that person. So that triage is actually done at the back end and the person who is disclosing has that consistency of one case manager who will be that key trusted contact to actually uh, support them and manage them through what is often a traumatic process. And I've spoken about it previously, but that sense of multidisciplinary teams, you know, often one person will not have all of the expertise to manage a situation. So we need to ensure that across the universities, each area actually understands what their core competencies are and also have a process for reaching into other areas to support as required. One of the certainly the themes that's come out and it came out during the hunting ground that we came out through um, the surveys with the National Union of Students and with the sort of day to day disclosures through our university is effective communication. And by that I mean not only across the you know, often people work in siloed areas. So to have a, an effective communication strategy that goes across the case management team also between the university and external parties. So there'll be cases when certainly the police become involved. So we need to have a set of protocols for if that is the case, what is the set of responsibilities for the university and what is the um, expectation of the police of our role? And that is actually not defined at all and it, it's very problematic and it depends on which police service you become involved with as to your experience of that. But uh, the Victorian Vice Chancellor's uh, Safety uh, Working Group is looking at trying to get a set of protocols and agreements between the Victorian universities and our state police so that we do have some consistency and approach to that because it's certainly causing some angst amongst victim survivors that they uh, have ineffective communication between the university support system and some of the external parties. So I think it's really important that there are a set of effective communication protocols and an understanding of how that will operate. 
Also, uh, Andrew was talking about the communication with leaders and I think it's really important because the reality is senior leaders will likely never have much to do with the case management of a disclosure. But it is important that they are informed so that they're able to uh, keep oversight of what's happening within the university and what the culture is actually looking like within the university. So effective communication up to the senior leadership group will not only help in terms of them understanding the culture and the environment of the university, but will also enable them to look at what are our hotspots, where does our resourcing need to go, are we actually effectively resourced in particular areas for which we are getting the most disclosures. So that decision making process is really critical to offering really high quality support to students. So that leader, that communication with leaders is really critical. And confidentiality, often a barrier to reporting. People are scared, do not trust the areas that they're going to in terms of disclosure. So we need to assure people and we need to practice what we preach and ensure that the information that people are coming to us with is safe and is only disclosed with their permission unless there are legal requirements to do otherwise. So in terms of responding to disclosure for staff, one of the key things we've certainly found is an under we need to really create a better understanding of what sexual violence is. Most people are unsure, most students are unsure and most staff are unsure about what constitutes uh, sexual violence. So it's really important that we have training in place such as this module from Epigem and that some training is actually mandatory and we can do that through induction processes, through annual equity and diversity uh, you know, modules that we have for compliance. We can also have some targeted training in terms of the frontline service staff that we know are going to be managing most of these cases to ensure that not only do they have a rudimental understanding of what's happening in this space, but that there's a continual and also more generally, the issue of disclosure, some people certainly within the universities think, well, this has nothing to do with me. But actually the skills that you gain through doing a course around disclosure about managing information, about listening to people, about referring on are actually general skills that can be applied to other areas of the university. And certainly in that family violence context, if somebody chooses to disclose, regardless of what that information is, the skills you get through doing the course such as the one being put together by Epigenome for Sexual Violence actually equips you with general skills that you can apply to other areas. So I think it's really important that when we do roll out this type of training that people are aware that while it might be specifically focused on the issue of sexual violence, that in fact the skills they gain will be um, applicable to a variety of areas across the university and their development as a professional. I also think that you know, one of the key things is having resources that are accessible and current. If you look at many websites, they may have resources but they're certainly outdated or they're incredibly difficult to find. So training resources, um, you know, they're really critical in enabling staff to be confident and competent in managing disclosure. Also importantly, it, it, it will help to meet the duty of care for the university, so actually decrease organisational risk if you have these resources that are both of quality and current. One of the important things for staff to also know is when and where to refer somebody. At the moment, most organisations do not have a clear central portal for people to get information when somebody comes and discloses to them. They also need to be aware that they're not necessarily there to solve a problem or to case manage, but they need to be able to support the student as well, we're all probably aware the first disclosure is critical to a person's experience management and recovery from incidents of violence, but also recognising that disclosure at any time increases a person's sense of vulnerability. So it's really important that the staff member is aware of their particular role when somebody comes to them to disclose the situation. And more importantly, where they go to next. So what information do they need in terms of the central portal, but also uh, who are the appropriate people within that space for them to refer to. Staff also really need to be aware of the services provided to them in managing disclosure. 
So the impact of disclosure on support providers can be traumatic and it's really critical that they're aware of their support options if they're experiencing issues. We'll hand over to Tessa now if that's all right. Great. Yeah, thank you, Corinne, and thank you, Andrew uh, and Nicole. Um, so I will now give you an overview of the Responding to Disclosures project, explain the key features and benefits of an online training resource, and outline the key collaboration stages. So firstly, why develop an online program on responding to sexual violence? So I won't spend too long on this. This has been covered already in the presentations. Um, but it, it's increasingly apparent that institutions do need to act and that there is a need for clear, simple and easily accessible guidance um, on how to respond to a disclosure uh, in order to minimise distress to all the individuals involved. Students and parents will expect universities to provide appropriate guidance on these issues. They will want to know that campuses are safe environments um, and it is therefore of reputational interest to provide staff with adequate training in this area. Um, on this same topic, training will ensure that, um, that a response does not compromise any subsequent investigations, um, pose a legal risk, or cause uh, further reputational damage. Um, so moving on to exactly why, what are the benefits of an online program? At base, an online program can save time, space, and resource, especially where staff are scattered geographically and, um, of course, have busy and conflicting timetables. It will enable institutions to scale up their training quickly, efficiently and flexibly. And it will ensure that all staff across all sites receive a consistent level of training. At Epigym, we have already developed online training in this topic area, having published a one-hour student-facing program, Consent Matters, earlier this year. This focuses on issues surrounding consent and also misconceptions and positive intervention. I will demo a couple of screens from this program at the end of this presentation. So, who is this programme, Responding to Disclosures of Sexual Violence, who is it for? Simply, it is for all staff, from senior management to student support staff, to housing officers, to porters. Although it is likely and advised that designated staff receive specialist training with regards to sexual violence and harassment, it is very important that all staff members feel able to respond to a disclosure. Students might know that there is a welfare office, for example, but they might choose to disclose to another member of staff whom they trust. So anyone can receive a disclosure and everyone needs to be equipped with the skills to respond. This project will provide fundamental university-wide training on the first response to a disclosure. Moving on to key features and benefits of an online programme. The Responding to Disclosures programme will be made up of a single course which in turn will be made up of four modules. So while comprehensive, it will also be compact, between 60 to 90 minutes in duration once built. We are developing a UK version of the programme, and whilst we understand that some of the general best practice guidelines will be applicable universally, we will tailor the approach and content to the Australian context, and we are developing a separate Australian version. Correspondingly, the programme will be customisable, insofar as institutions will be able to add screens and pods, these are little clickable boxes on the side of the screen, to reflect and link to their own institutional policies, referral pathways and individual contacts. We will use realistic scenarios to help learning in the form of text, comic strips and audio or video material. This is a key part of our pedagogical design, which ensures that users will progress through the course in a methodical and consistent way. So the aims of the programme. In a nutshell, as this slide shows, participants um, by the end of the course will be able to define the nature of consent and identify the legal definition of sexual assault and rape, recognise common misconceptions around sexual assault, respond to an individual appropriately, demonstrating empathy and establishing boundaries, explain the different support options available to an individual, Demonstrate the best practices, the best sort of practical steps in responding to a disclosure and apply these in line with institutional policy and recognise when they, the staff member, may need support in dealing with a disclosure. This next slide here um, just provides more detail on the module content. So as you can see, we start with 
Setting the Context, um, which explores the sexualized culture at universities and the prevalence of sexual violence more widely. Module 2, Understanding Sexual Violence, then focuses on what um, sexual violence and consent actually means and dismantles common myths. We then plan to progress um, to discuss barriers in reporting um, in Module 3, uh, understanding and supporting the individual. So throughout this module, we are really keen to emphasise the importance of responding empathetically in a non-judgmental way, uh, in providing support options in an, in an informative way, which allows the survivor to make their own decisions. Um, here's an example where universities might want to customise, they might want to insert their own links to the care options in their local areas. The final module, how to respond to a disclosure, guides participants on the practical steps on, the, on exactly what they need to do or what they need to think about when dealing with a disclosure. Uh, advice will be organised in a granular, succinct way and will include topics such as um, how to create an appropriate space, to recording evidence, to the issues to consider with regards to both internal and external reporting, and importantly, it will also cover self-care. Throughout the process, as um, this webinar has shown, we will be liaising with advisors and reviewers both in Australia and in the UK. It is crucial that we include the most accurate and most appropriate advice, and we are very pleased to have such enthusiastic and knowledgeable experts on board. So here on this slide we have our advisors and author. And this next one shows our expert review panel. In this way, our development group members will play a vital role in the production process. We ask development group members to contribute to in-depth discussions from the start of the writing process, as Annie outlined earlier. At the workshop stage, and say our workshop will be on the 6th of December, Participating universities will be able to review the current module outlines and approach and provide us with valuable feedback and guidance. Following this, the author and staff at Epigean will take all the feedback into account and write up the first proper storyboard drafts. In February, we will have a peer review stage, so this week called the Alpha Review, at which development group members will again be able to review the whole course in a more complete storyboard form. We will then amend and hone the course content based on the feedback and build the interactive screens with an aim to publishing in May 2017. I will now show you a few examples of screens from our existing online courses uh, to give you an idea of the possible features in an Epigeum programme. So starting off with the programme I mentioned earlier, Consent Matters. This programme was published earlier this year and was, is aimed at first year undergraduates or those who are new to university. So we were very keen here to create um, a really positive, not a punitive resource. There's a very serious message, but the tone is, and design is youthful and engaging. And this is the welcome screen. So as you can see, we provide information just at in the beginning. And we also include an animation here. I'll just play a short extract of it uh, to give you an idea. Sex and relationships. You understand what's involved, right? You may have heard people talking about sexual consent and thought, what's the big deal? We all know no means no. But there's more to consent than a simple yes or no. Consent is an ongoing conversation. Whether you're in a casual or a long-term relationship, mm -hmm. consent matters. We need to notice when consent is and is not present, and know how to act accordingly. This course will show you what consent looks and sounds like. Mm -hmm. How you can clearly yeah. communicate what you want. When consent can be given, and when it can't. For example, what happens if... So that, that's a short extract there. In the Responding to Disclosures program, we will also include animations to get participants thinking and reflecting. But the design and tone it will be different, it will be tailored for a staff audience. I'll just quickly show you another screen from the same program. This is a screen called Consent 101 and it tackles a number of misconceptions. So in this activity, participants 
would click on each each misconception in turn and it flips over to tell the truth about consent so for example uh, saying no it just means persuade me This activity taps into the themes around respecting boundaries and building confidence about communicating your own boundaries too. Again, these themes will be present in responding to disclosures, but we will, we will make sure to shape it so that, again, it's suitable for a wide-ranging adult audience, and we will show how understanding these issues will help staff members to respond to disclosures. Moving to a different program now, so the screen that I'm now showing is from another recently published program called Blended Learning, which um, aims to help university educators improve their skills and understanding of combining face-to-face -face and online teaching methods. I wanted to show you this screen because it demonstrates a, a different approach, a different audience, and a completely different topic. As you can see, it is, it is much, much more detailed, it is longer, with some useful diagrams. And uh, at the bottom, an, an interactive activity which asks participants to work out a timeline for the implementation of their assessment plan. Um, participants have to write a list of their assessment elements according to how high stakes they are, then drag each element onto the timeline below. So, for example, under low stakes assessments, you might write quiz. And then you can drag this onto your timeline and think, oh, I might do that in week two. Uh, at the end, once you have filled in everything, you can view a summary, which is also printable. You will have also noticed the pods on the right-hand side of the screen. Here. These pods contain extra information about the main screen content, as well as documents to download, definitions of key terms, and links to further reading. We do plan to include various pods in responding to disclosures, including ones that can be customised, such as the Your Context pod here. This pod prompts users to find out more about their local context and allows institutions, should they want to, to insert their own more specific information. For disclosures, we plan to combine elements from our existing programmes and to develop and adapt new interactive pedagogical features. Um, the programme will have a unique design, again tailored for the topic and the audience. I hope I have given you a good taste of our work and vision with this short demo. If you do have any questions about these or the disclosures programme in general, please do note them down now. Um, and thank you very much for listening. So thank you everyone for listening to this webinar. If you do have any questions, please note them down now. And I'll just go to our final slide here. So you can see our contact details here. Um, we can give you a lot more detail in regards to pricing and timescales for the collaboration. So please do contact us if you have any questions. Um, we're also able to provide you with a trial of one of our existing courses. So you can get an idea of the look and feel and how they function. And we'll also send out a recording of this presentation to you so you can share it with the relevant colleagues who might find it of interest. I'll end the webinar here, but thank you so much everyone for attending and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Goodbye.